funny enough, I actually did really well in the class and I really loved it. And so that's how I found my passion. I just kind of stumbled. (laughs) <laughs> stumbled into it. So I had to figure out, like, how do I do this? And someone told me that DevRel was uh, a role. I'm really careful as an uh, advocate myself to make sure that I stay on the cutting edge of technology and that I keep my, my uh, engineering skills sharp. So I've always been an explorer. And as, I, uh, as new texts come out, I would, like, look at them and see, can they be used to solve, like, different problems? Or can yeah. they be combined with other... Uh, technology to do something totally different. Hey, welcome to another episode of Coffee with Developers. Today with Angie Jones, she is Global VP of DevRel at TBD. Welcome, Thank Angie. You. How are you doing? I'm great. How are you, Mark? Good, good, good. I'm good. Um, thanks for taking uh, time to come and uh, interview with us. Uh, first of all, you, you work at TBD. What, can you tell us what is TBD and what, yeah. you, what you do there? Sure. So TBD is the newest business unit of Block, mm-hmm. and we are focused on building decentralized technologies. Mm-hmm. So that's tooling for developers as well as protocols and things of that nature. And I am the head of developer relations and programs. And so I uh, lead the developer relations, community management, as well as our open source initiatives. Cool. How, with how many uh, DevRels do you work there? You, it says you're, you're global, so... Yeah, how, yeah, yeah. So, so we're, we're, we're really... Scra- <laughs> it sounds bigger than it is, Mark. <laughs> we're uh, really scrappy. Uh, the business unit itself is less than two years old. Okay. And so um, we have about three uh, developer advocates mm-hmm. right now, uh, and then a couple of other folks on uh, the open source programs teams and uh, community management. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. Uh, can you tell us about a little bit about uh, how you got in tech? What's your first in- experience in tech? And a little mm-hmm. bit about your journey? Yeah, sure. So. I grew up not knowing much about tech at mm-hmm. all, um, and I went to college like really unsure of what I wanted to, to do with mm-hmm. my life. Um, I didn't know anyone who like was into computers or anything mm-hmm. like that. My father was an accountant at the time, and he realized that tech was becoming this emerging mm-hmm. space, and so he suggested that mm-hmm. I take a computer class so okay. that I knew yeah. you know, how yeah. to use what one. Is, yeah, works, you know, I yeah. could check my email or something, yeah. you know? <laughs> And me, I, I knew so little about computers that mm-hmm. I didn't even know what class to choose. Oh, yeah. And I chose a C++ programming as my <laughs> intro oh. to the world of computers. <laughs> but uh, funny enough, I actually did really well in the class and I really loved it. And so that's how I found my passion. I just kind of stumbled, <laughs> stumbled into it like really naively. And uh, I ended up choosing that as my major, computer science. What did you love about? You said you did very well in the class. I suppose you really liked it. What did you like about like yeah. C plus plus or probably programming <laughs> in, in general? In general yeah. yeah, I it felt like a puzzle. So I grew up playing games a lot in my mm-hmm. family, and so I really love like those sort of challenges that make you think and you put pieces together mm-hmm. to like come up with this final solution, right? I yeah. really like that sort of thing, um, and this is what programming felt like to me. So it was like given a problem figure out how to come up with a solution yeah. given these programming constructs, if you will. Yeah. And so um, I remember just like racing out of class whenever we would get an assignment for homework. I couldn't wait to go <laughs> to the computer lab. We didn't have a computer at home yeah. still. I would go to the computer lab, work on my assignment, have it done like that. I really, really enjoyed it. And I still do to this day. So are you like me, the kind of person that enjoys more solving the problem in your head than actually coding it out? No, I love coding. Oh my God, (laughs) I love coding. (laughs) Awesome. So then, uh, how did you get into DevRel Mm. then? Yeah, good question. So um, I actually needed to hire some engineers. We had like, Mm -hmm. uh, back then I was working on automation and we had five recs that we needed to hire for. And as we were interviewing, my team was pretty big 
And as we were interviewing folks, we couldn't really find anybody that was on the level that the team was on. Like, not a lot of people do automation as a specialty. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so I thought then, like, I should probably start writing about how we do things yeah. to kind of, I don't know, give back to the community and yeah. share our techniques. Because we had a really strong team that basically mm -hmm. iron sharpened iron, you know, and we learned from each other. Mm -hmm. But all of that was siloed into our company. Oh, yeah, and so yeah. I started like blogging about it and then um, going to conferences and speaking mm -hmm. about it. And then I just really enjoyed the teaching aspect, mm -hmm. teaching other engineers how to do something. And it just kind of came naturally. I was doing this so much. I was away from my <laughs> full-time engineering job. I remember I was an engineer at Twitter at the time. And um, I was on the road probably about 80% of the time going to conferences, oh, okay. workshops, and stuff like that. And then I thought, like, I need to figure out how to do this sort of thing full-time. Mm -hmm. But I can't go, like, teach in the college. I did that as an adjunct. I know that doesn't pay, yeah. you know? <laughs> And so I had to figure out, like, how do I do this? And someone told me that DevRel was uh, a role. Uh, like and I said, thing, oh, right? my God, this like, this is like, what I want to do. And so I went into DevRel. Up. That's right. <laughs> sign me up. And I've never looked back. Awesome. So there's a lot of stuff that you can do in DevRel. Um, but what are some of the pitfalls that you identified mm. uh, working in DevRel? Yeah, that's a good question. So... And working in DevRel, especially if you're working for a company, like you're kind of sp specializing in something that they do, right? Yeah. And their tool. And you're kind of repeating that over and over again mm -hmm. across the globe <laughs> into like new engineers each time. So one pitfall that I see is not touching the production code and advancing mm -hmm. your skills as you would if you were doing traditional engineering, okay. right? So DevRel, there are some roles that, you know, they're very technical DevRel roles. So you're still like coding and yeah. building toy apps, yeah. but not necessarily production ones, you know what I mean? And so I'm really careful as an uh, advocate myself to make sure that I stay on the cutting edge of technology yeah. and that I keep my, my uh, engineering skills sharp. Yeah, so that's something I also see in others, also a little bit myself, that I don't code as much as I would really like to. Mm -hmm. not, e not even talking about production stuff. So. <laughs> yeah. All right, so let's get a little bit away from the DevRel stuff. Okay. Something that's very interesting about you is you are an inventor and you are the, the author of 27 patents. Yes. So first, congrats on that. That's Thank you. very impressive. Uh, what made you want to... Uh, like no let's first go uh, what are your patents about oh. to start with <laughs> like I know there's some about software engineering yeah. uh, processes yeah. and stuff can you tell us a little bit more about it yeah sure um, so I used to work at IBM and IBM is like the leader of patents in the <laughs> world right and so it was really innovation was really big in the company's culture back then mm -hmm. and as we would work on our products um, we were encouraged to think about like are you doing something new mm -hmm. and if so you know let's let's patent it and things okay. like that and then you could also even things you're not necessarily working on but you could explore other techs so I've always been an explorer and as I uh, as new techs come out I would like look at them and see can they be used to solve like different problems or can yeah. they be combined with other uh, technology to do something totally different mm -hmm. and so a lot of my my patents are you know in collaboration software uh, metaverse oh, yeah. uh, you know things like this uh, things that I actually see come later on today yeah uh, you know and it's really cool so yeah the the, the funny thing about patents People think like, you know, I built all these things. You don't even necessarily have to build the thing. You have to describe it's it from an architecture. How, how one would build it, How right? would you build it? So I have to like say, okay, this is novel. No one has ever thought of this before. Yeah. And here's how you would go about building something like this. And that's enough. So if I looked at a patent from you and I was like, this is interesting. I want to build it. What does it imply? Do I have to pay to use your patent or... How does it work? Right. So <laughs> the funny thing is when you work for a company, like they own all of your thoughts, yeah, right? Yeah. And so technically, uh, IBM owns my patents. I'm listed as the, the inventor. Author. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I do get I my it. credit in the world, okay. you know. I'm listed and they also pay 
uh, pay you, you know, yeah. for, for for the patents and things like that. But a lot of companies are starting to uh, donate their patents yeah. or like make them freely available, you know, uh, so that other people can't just kind of monopolize a concept. But yeah. you know, so we're we'll, we're starting to see that. And then there's also business to business exchanges. So a big company like IBM, they might do something with like Microsoft where they yeah. say, hey, let's trade. A couple of patents yeah, so yeah. that we could do things so it's, it's a business move yeah. yeah so what would you say is the benefit of having a patent like what does it do for the company or for you that maybe protects the idea or yeah something? so it, it gives you first rights to things yeah. you know like if you want to uh, you know be the first one to implement something you have yeah. that that right to do so it also generates additional income for the company as they mm -hmm. license out the patent yeah. so you know another business might not want to trade but they'll pay you in order to have yeah. the license yeah. to, to implement the product that's going to be very beneficial for them so it's 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 lucrative okay cool and what's the process of writing out a patent so a mm -hmm. pattern, a patent so you have to be very specific probably very specific. is it uh, is it a pain creating a patent actually so uh, if I were to do it myself yes okay. the beauty of doing it with a company is that they have what they call intellectual property lawyers and attorneys ah, so, so I can write it in my own word as if I were writing a blog post Oh, and they I translate give it, it to for them. You, They're you fairly technical. That's <laughs> it. They translate it to all the legal legal jargon yeah. and things like that. Okay. Then one last thing. What would you say is an is a advice for beginners that also want to explore uh, inventing mm. patents and getting a little bit into that? How to get started even with? Yeah, it? sure. It's a, a I call it an inventor's mindset, mm -hmm. and you turn this little switch on in your head. Mm -hmm. So all of us, as we run into problems, we get a little bit aggravated. Mm -hmm. What you can do is turn on a, a sensor that says, whenever I'm annoyed, think. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you an example of like one of my patents. I was in a grocery store. We all have had this problem where you choose the wrong cue, right? Yeah, this one, yeah, you're yeah, like, yeah, oh, yeah. that looks like the best one. I go get in that line and never fails. That was the wrong line. <laughs> so you're frustrated. And as I'm sitting in this queue, I'm frustrated. How could I have solved this and made this better? And so then I started coming up with like, okay, what are a lot of things that we could put together so that you can give an estimated time on each of these cues, right? In yeah. this physical format. And it's much different than, um, you know, other cue weights that you might think of because there's so many factors. There's yeah. like the cashier scan rate. There's how many items does each person yeah. have? Is the person going to pull out a bunch of coupons, right? Yeah. Are they going to send the lady back to go get cigarettes or like uh, yeah. liquor? Or so, you know, there's so many things. And you can start looking at people's like habits from their loyalty cards yeah. and things. So what if you aggregated all this information together to produce a new result? Yeah, I, I read once about it a few years back that th there's someone that made a formula for it, a mathematical formula, mm. including a bunch of, of those uh, that might have been me Mark? No, from, okay. from, <laughs> yeah but it's very interesting and they came up with the easiest way is to look at the at the amount of items the mm -hmm. person the people have so that's like the biggest factor the biggest multiplying mm -hmm, factor there mm -hmm. uh, so yeah so thanks Angie for yeah. all, taking your time first and for all your insights it's been great having you and uh, everyone that watched this or listened to this Thanks a lot and see you in the next episode. Bye-bye.